Thank you all for coming tonight. It's great to see a full house and so many um, people here tonight. I have the honor of introducing our four Cole Fellows for the 2018-19 season. How many of you were here last year or at a, have been to a previous presentation by our fellows? Okay, good. Well, then you, you might know what I'm already going to say, which is this year these fellows have been quite possibly my favorite group of fellows. <laughs> and I really, I really do mean it. And, and I, feel, I feel so lucky that every year I get to this point where, oh, my God, this was the best group we've ever had. I really mean it. So I feel lucky. Um, but this group does stand apart from other groups um, that we've had. For starters, um, I feel like you guys have read more deeply Thomas Cole's own words than any other group, in part because in the first month they were here, they transcribed Thomas Cole's entire journal, 1834 to 1848. And um, no one had ever done that before. We only had little parts and sections. Um, since they know Cole's inner thoughts so well, I think I have a suspicion that if they were required to figure out, for instance, what house Thomas Cole would be sorted into in Hogwarts if he was with Harry Potter, they would know this. They would know what house he was supposed to be in. <laughs> but, um, but really, they were, you were very keenly uh, invested in Cole. And I would go down to our meetings, to their office, and there would be a different quote by Thomas Cole on their bulletin board almost every week. And um, I borrowed one from their bulletin board because I think it sets a tenor for the work that you all did this, this year. He who follows is always behind. It's an apt saying. And if we sit down contented with the belief that to equal what has already been done is the loftiest aim which modern art can take, we must abandon hope of great excellence. Um, these guys are leaders. The Corcoran, Loyola, Villanova, Princeton, their alma maters are very impressive. Um, but I think it's your intellectual curiosity and your drive and your creativity that um, speaks loudest. And um, each of you are leaders. And you seem to have equal confidence and heart and creativity and persistence. And it's just been like the right combination. Um, this group has had a can-do attitude. There's nothing that's been, there's nothing that they've said, oh, no, we can't do that. We're too busy. Oh, no, do we have to do that? Like everything um, that we've thrown at them, you've risen to the challenge. And, and I, I feel like it's not because it's what's expected of you because you can't help it. Like, you're just driven. And um, especially for intellectual curiosity and research. Um, but our fellows this year have been a vital part of everything we've done from exhibitions and publications um, to working with VIP tours to launching new tours to creating new exhibitions um, with materials in our collection um, to doing events for children. I think you guys have led over 200 tours and welcomed audiences. And we'll have the treat and pleasure of hearing uh, more about also the primary research that um, our fellows conducted this year. We are going to hold questions till the very end of all the presentations. Each one is gonna be 15 to maybe 17 minutes long. Um, and at the end, we'll have a chance to ask questions. So if you have something burning that you want to ask, save it uh, till the end. Um, and please take a look at the programs at your seat to read their impressive bios and the names of their presentations. Um, I'm going to leave you with another quote by Thomas Cole. If the imagination is shackled, seldom will anything truly great be produced either in painting or poetry. I feel like the same is true for our work that we do here at the coal site and for research. It's kind of like you don't know what the answer is. You have to jump off this cliff into an unknown place. And I've been so impressed with um, how you've handled the unknown questions and the answers and discoveries you've made this year. 
Um, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks on behalf of everyone here uh, for the work that you've done, the exceptional work that you've done, for the imagination and the courage that you've brought to everything you've done here. Um, you remind me why our work and this site matters, and you give us a glimpse of um, what we might imagine our future to be. And so I'm gonna stop talking because I think you guys represent yourselves better than I could ever do. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Katie Pratt Thompson, Amanda Malmstrom, Maeve McCool, and Peter Fedorik. Hello. My name is Katie Pratt Thompson, and on behalf of all the fellows, we just want to say thank you so much for coming out today. We're incredibly excited to share with you what we've been working on uh, during our time here at the Coal site. Over the past 10 months, I have been researching the mineral collection of Thomas Cole. This collection of 92 objects sits in the creative process room of the main house in an 18 by 20 inch collection box. The 92 objects in this box are 92 unique stories that extend across thousands of miles and scatter through ranges of time. We read the journals, poetry, and letters of Thomas Cole. We analyze his sketches and we study his paintings, but we are yet to fully read these objects for the insights they illuminate. That has been the goal of my project here at the Cole site to bring a voice to this incredible resource of rich material in order to add to our understanding of the artist. This collection is far more than a box of random assemblage. They, these are objects of personal reflections, historical indicators, artistic inspirations, and flashpoints of scientific dialogues. As an artist in the early to mid 19th century, Thomas Cole was working during a time of dramatic and dynamic transformation rife with political turmoil, social anxieties, and defining moments in our country's formation. From a scientific perspective, these shifts were just as cataclysmic. Although Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species would not be published until 1859, over a decade after Thomas Cole's passing, questions of validity and authority regarding the natural sciences had already risen to the surface of heated debates. Works of art like Charles Wilson Peale's The Exhumation of the Mastodon were emblematic of the population's growing desire to explore, excavate, and order the world around them. The United States was searching for historic associations as validation for their identity, and many of their answers came from the earth itself. Through the study of geology, rocks became sources of a far deeper history than anyone had previously imagined. Geology offered a solution to the nation's desire for an antiquity of its own. There was no longer a constructed container of time. It was in this flurry of ideas and dramatic shifts in understanding that Thomas Cole painted the natural world. So what was Cole's relationship to geology and the natural sciences? The artist found himself placed amidst this post-Humboldt, pre-Darwinian world underscored by the art critic John Ruskin and his truth to nature approach to artistic practice. We know that Cole engaged in these conversations and within these subject matters. He owned and read J.L. Comstock's 1834 Outlines of Geology and Ebenezer Emmons's Geological Survey of New York State in 1836. Two of Cole's most prominent patrons, Robert Gilmore and Lumen Reed, were both practicing geologists. Cole corresponded with the Yale geologist and founder of the American Journal of Science, Benjamin Silliman, and scholars Elwood Perry III and Frank Kelly have argued that the landscape painter would have been well acquainted with Charles Lyell's principles of geology. Cole even went on fossil hunting excursions with his friend William A. Adams during the early years of his, of his career. So while geology had not reached its apex of popularity during the artist's lifetime, Thomas Cole was undoubtedly aware of the progressions taking place within the scientific community. So what is this collection and what does it tell us? It is an intersection between the human and the non-human. It is a documentation of interaction. Interaction amongst people, places, history, and the natural world. 
The collection is everything from ammonite fossils to arrowheads to relics of ancient Rome to wood fragments of a musket hole from the Battle of Waterloo. Because of this encompassing nature, the collection does not fall under one heading, nor should it. The array of artifacts mimics the extensions of Cole's fascinations, inquiries, and depths as an artist of the 19th century, and becomes as complicated as the man himself. Through his text and sketch work, I was able to place many of these objects in specific locations and time frames where Cole would have likely encountered them. During this process, many of my days were filled with lengthy asides and rabbit holes as I worked to best determine the provenance of these items. While some days left me staring blankly at a rock that would never speak back to me, others were met with incredible excitement when unforeseen collisions created answers to my questions. The first item of the collection I am showing you all is a quartz mineral acquired from, by coal from Ball's Cave in Skahari. What is particularly interesting about this specimen is the level of detail we have surrounding the object itself. Cole explored this cave in 1838 and wrote a lengthy journal entry following the excursion. To paraphrase a section of his entry, on October 9th, he writes, On Monday, in the company with Mr. Griffin, I set out to visit the great cave at Skahari. The cave entrance is near the summit of a hill. We descended by means of ladders, perhaps 150 feet, then came to a low and narrow passage which leads to a subterranean lake. The water is perfectly clear, and the perpendicular walls of rock descend into it to unknown depths. There is something awful about being suspended in such an abyss. And there, decorations, the stalactites, have principally been carried away, and nothing is left but the damp, dark walls of limestone, gloomy and silent, but for the hissing of bats, which hang from the roof like innumerable drops of black poison. While the specimen itself is not a rare gem or mineral of any kind, it is everything surrounding the object that makes it a substantial item in this collection. Quartz is local to the Catskills, with which Cole would have been familiar. It begs the question, why did the artist feel the need to collect this item? I believe the answer lies in the thoughtful reflections of the artist himself. Cole's decision to include this in his collection points to the way in which the artist approached his surroundings, with an eye for detail regardless of predetermined rank or significance. The quartz mineral is emblematic of a space for coal, and so to collect it points to a dedication to truthful observation, a curiosity towards the geological formations of the landscape, and the need to create a tangibility of a moment. During this time, rocks were at the heart of heated debates surrounding the readjustment of a human timeline and the deeper histories of Earth's formation. Scientific discoveries were used to both overturn and confirm traditional biblical timelines. For an artist like Cole, who believed in a diluvian formation of the Earth, these discoveries were sources of verification. Rocks and other geological formations were indicators of a deeper history and very much tied to a scriptural understanding of human creation. As delineators of the subject, Landscape painters were fundamentally intertwined in these exchanges, and for many people, their artwork reflected such. So while this quartz mineral points to a moment in Cole's excursions as an artist, it is also largely reflective of the stakes held by geological specimens at the time. We next travel over 3,000 miles to Kenilworth Castle in England. I understand this rock doesn't look all that spectacular, but what is captivating about this small stone is the reverberation and layers embedded in a rock that is very much hidden in plain sight. Through text, artwork, and other collected material, it becomes clear that this stone reflects many extensions of Cole's fascinations with history, geology, and objects connected to the specificity of place. In a letter to his wife, Mariah, in 1841, Cole wrote, the weather was delightful when I was at Kenilworth, the country rich and beautiful, and the ruins went beyond my expectations. The ivy-clad towers, roofless halls, whose floors are covered with green turf and flowers, over which, through the dismantled windows and ragged loopholes, the sun casts his wandering rays, inspired me with a melancholy pleasure. 
You can hear the reaches of a distant past echoed in Cole's words as he speaks of dismantled ruins and the overgrowth of fauna capable only through lapses of extended time. Cole sketched the historic structure and also collected pressed flowers from the site, which are hung on the walls of our creative process room in the main house. In 1846, the artist also created a finished oil work of Kenilworth Castle. We have all these pieces to the puzzle, and yet they become encapsulated by one small rock. Granted, the concept of keeping a souvenir from a place you visited is no novel idea. The difference, however, is what items like this represented in the context of natural sciences during the 19th century. They were tethers to a past time, a corporal index linking the then to the now. This rock from Kenilworth Castle gives a tangibility to a distant space through an object already rooted in conceptions of deep time. What separates Cole's mineral collection from many of his contemporaries is the absence of rigid assemblage. While most collections of this kind characteristically address the notion of human and non-human interaction, Cole takes this intervention in a different direction. This is a small section from a mosaic at the Temple of Jupiter. The label currently reads, Mosaic from Temple of Jupiter, Trieste. But there is good reason to believe that the mosaic has been labeled incorrectly. The handwritten label is not Thomas Cole's script, but likely that of another Cole family member likely of a later generation. Although there is a temple of Jupiter in Trieste, the artist did not travel to that region of Italy during his European voyages. It is far more probable that Cole collected this item during his time in Pompeii, where another ruin of a temple of Jupiter stands. This became all the more likely when searching through various preparatory works of Cole, I found a graphite sketch in the collection of the Detroit Institute of Arts titled Pompeii Temple of Jupiter, dated 1832. I spoke with a doctoral candidate at the University of Pennsylvania, Emily French, who specializes in floor mosaics of Roman antiquity, and although the fragment is rather small in size and modest in design, she was able to date the piece to the first or second century CE. This time frame aligns with the date 62 CE, when the original temple was destroyed in an earthquake, and a secondary structure whose ruins Cole would have seen took its place. So why do we now find this classical mosaic in Catskill? Well, Cole was an adamant admirer of architectural beauty. He found inspiration and magnificence in man-made objects as he did with the natural phenomena of his surroundings. But there is more than just physical beauty in Cole's intent. He wrote in a letter to his parents in 1832, during his time abroad, that the antiquities of Rome, quote, fill the mind with wonder. The relic status of many of these objects he brought back with him demonstrate Cole's fascination with a deeper time, which he uses to connect with civilizations of the past and create personal links between their then and his now. Lastly, I want to touch on a group of objects that have a more geological foundation. The three minerals that you see here are all specimens of volcanic origin. With the help and expertise of Professor Jeff Walker at Vassar, many of the more mineralogical-based items in the collection were identified. During that process, it became clear that a number of these specimens originate from Cole's time spent in the volcanic regions of Italy. In 1832, the artist traveled through Campania, exploring and sketching the volcano Vesuvius. In 1842, during his second European voyage, Cole followed in the footsteps of the geologist Charles Lyell and climbed Mount Etna in Sicily. Embraced for both their beauty as well as their geological exceptionalism, Cole spent a great deal of time traversing the landscapes of these volcanoes, sketching and writing as he went. He collected a handful of specimens during these explorations, a few of which I show you here. I'll briefly explain what you guys are looking at exactly. On the far left is a small container filled with volcanic particles, specifically the product of a fumarole environment. Fumaroles are vents that derive from the openings of the Earth's crust in which volcanic gas escapes into the atmosphere, forming particles like the ones you see there. 
In the center is a mineral specimen of volcanic glass, which is the product of an explosion. When rhyolite magma is blown to the surface, it forms a glass called obsidian, which is the dark, glossy portion seen on the rock surface. And finally, the image on the right is what we call a volcanic cinder. This gas bubble-filled particle is the result of magma that froze after it burst into the air and quickly cooled to form this small rock. Understanding what these objects are is important as it allows us to place them in a location and within a time frame. However, the reason behind their collection and their connection to Cole himself is what makes them a highlighted portion of this presentation. Like a number of objects in the collection, these minerals are not of exceptional beauty or rare quality, and yet Cole collected them and brought them back with him to Catskill. Why? Again, I argue that the reason stems from the underlying context of such pieces more than the compositional makeup of the objects themselves. These minerals reflect the intricacies of observation Cole took throughout his artistic practice. In this sketch, titled Panorama of the Bay of Naples, you can make out the lines of notation taken by the artist as he describes the volcano Vesuvius. Cole once wrote in a journal, quote, it is absolutely necessary that the painter have a minute, I may say anatomical knowledge of nature as well as a general one. We see a direct reflection of that sentiment in his sketch as he breaks down the natural structures of what he observes in an effort to describe what his eye is taking in. I believe that Cole faces a very real dilemma of translating what his eye encounters. He knows more about the landscape than what he can physically see. More so, the immensity of what he can see is still impossible to fully reproduce in such detail on a canvas. The removal between his lens of a methodical perspective and what he wishes he could manifest through paint is so distilled, maybe it needs supplement. Perhaps the act of collecting serves as another window to seeing, just as his sketches and notations facilitate his observations. With these objects, Cole establishes a physical connection point to a place, holding on to a level of geological detail that is often lost in his finished work. Apart from what these volcanic specimens tell us about the topographical surroundings of Cole's environments during his travels, these items also indicate a scientific mindset. The artist's vision of the world was often romantic, yet it was threaded with layers of close observation and attention to detail. Volcanoes were devices of inquiry and study. They spoke to a deeper time and to a deeper past. Although his finished work is oftentimes more focused on the composite whole rather than a direct translation of empirical observation, objects such as these volcanic specimens bring us back to the intricacies that flooded the artist's mind. In Cole's words, the ages past have bequeathed to us their inestimable treasures and deep aesthetic lessons. Knowledge flows in, science facilitates, and makes us acquainted with the material of art. And it requires no prophetic spirit to predict a day of art brighter than man has ever yet seen. The stories I have shared with you today are emblematic of the rich source material that can be found throughout the entire collection. Cole collected not just items, but moments, places, and spaces in time. While this mineral collection sheds light on the artist's engagement with geology and scientific thinking of the era, the complexities and sometimes obscurities of these objects defies one conception of understanding. This assemblage of minerals, artifacts, and artificial specimens is a documentation in its own right. They point to the very real intricacies of the artist himself and are a primary source as multifaceted and thoughtful as any collection of writings or sketches. This is not a surface level collection. It demands to be read deeply which I believe reflects the continuous approach we take to Thomas Cole here at the site. There is always another avenue to explore, another rock to overturn, and a constantly shifting idea of what we claim to know and understand. Thank you. I would now like to introduce Amanda Malmstrom.
Thank you, Katie, and good evening, everybody. My name is Amanda Molmstrom, and I have spent the past nine months as a Cole Fellow following in the footsteps not only of Thomas Cole, but I've also been following in the footsteps of the women who called Cedar Grove home and the women who painted in the Hudson River School. In June, I came to Catskill from Chicago, where I had recently written a thesis on a radical contemporary feminist artist collective. So really, what a jump it has been from studying the angry imagery of zines and ephemeral posters to being immersed in the rooted history of American landscape painting. My deep interest in the museum profession informed my decision to accept the position of Cole Fellow, but I arrived still wondering, how would I be able to continue pursuing women's and gender studies at the home of a white male artist 19th century? At the beginning of this fellowship, I jumped at the opportunity to conduct research on a topic that excited me, but I knew little about. The women amidst the well-known and thoroughly researched lives and works of the 19th century male artists who found artistic inspiration in the beauty of the Hudson Valley. Initially, I sifted through museum collections to see if I could locate work by Hudson River School painters that I could study, specifically the women. The Wadsworth Athenaeum, boasting one of the largest collections of over 65 Hudson River School paintings, holds no work by a woman. The Met's collection of American landscape paintings is also without female representation. The Albany Institute of Art, which has a beautifully reinstalled Hudson River School uh, painting installation in their Hearst Gallery, does indeed hold work by Sarah Cole, Thomas Cole's sister, but only two works amidst the dozens of works by well-known male artists, such as Frederick Church, Albert Bierstadt, Asher Durand, George Ines, Thomas Moran, Thomas Cole, and the list goes on and on. This trend begs the question, why are the most well-known and exhibited Hudson River School artists men? Where can we place women within the history of the first major American art movement? And where are the women in contemporary scholarship and exhibitions surrounding the Hudson River School? In conducting research aiming to answer these questions, I have been nothing but inspired by the potential that undeniably exists for American art scholarship, museums, and educational organizations like the Thomas Cole National Historic Site to enrich and enliven the established narrative of American art and painting. The Cole Site is indeed cognizant of the power and importance of elevating the lesser known works of women artists. In 2010, the site organized Remember the Ladies, the only known exhibition to focus solely on the women artists of the Hudson River School, some of whose works are pictured here. Remember the Ladies is a welcome step forward in understanding that the history of Thomas Cole, the Hudson River School, and American art, even in its earliest years, is incomplete without the consideration of the lives and labor of women. My research continues the important work started by Remember the Ladies and reopened by 2017 Cole Fellow Rowan Dean, who specifically conducted research on the women artists of Cedar Grove, Sarah Cole and Emily Cole. I began my research by compiling a list of all the women I could find who painted in the Hudson River School, cataloging works ascribed to them and piecing together their biographies. This was a difficult task, considering the lack of museum representation and the fact that traditional studies of male-dominated art historical movements, including the Hudson River School, often adhere to tokenism identifying only a small handful of women and identifying them as unique for achieving success. Yet, Remember the Ladies included work by 13 women artists, and I have since identified over 30 women by name who, like their male counterparts, found inspiration in the nature of the Hudson Valley and captured its beauty in sweeping, sublime, and picturesque landscapes. This group includes Eliza Great Terex, the first woman to attain membership in the National Academy of Design, and a widow who supported her children by selling her artwork. Josephine Chamberlain Ellis, the wife of a congressman and the president of the Women's Indian Association, a group of white women devoting to assimilating Native people. And Charlotte Boyle Coleman, who was completely deaf when she started painting in her 40s and who exhibited at both New York and Paris salons. These three women are just a handful of many more female artists whose work stand with great potential today to study the racial, political, social, and artistic climate of the 19th century. This being said, 
Why has traditional scholarship continued to perpetuate tokenism instead of highlighting the lives and works of the plethora of women working in the Hudson River School? Scholarship often cites women's dress, lack of access to education, and gender conventions as preventing women from pursuing landscape painting in the 19th century. Scholar Jennifer Krieger explores this trend and cites Worthington Rittridge, a popular Hudson River School painter who claimed that women's large skirts got in the way of climbing mountains and cliffs, and women, quote, do not know how to stick an umbrella into the ground, end quote. <laughs> Whitridge obviously did not know about the outings of Susie Barstow and Sarah Cole, artists represented in the Cole site collection, to whom hiking was an integral part of their artistic practice. An 1889 issue of the White Mount Mountain Echo claimed that Barstow scaled the Catskills, Adirondacks, White Mountains, Alps, Black Forest Mountains, and is said to have hiked 25 miles a day, even in the midst of a blinding snowstorm. In an 1838 entry in Thomas Cole's journal, we know that Sarah Cole often hiked with her brother to Catterskill Clove, as well as through the wooded hills of the village of Catskill. So as erroneous as Whitridge's sentiments are, his ideas indeed linger in contemporary scholarship that justify tokenism by citing apparel limitations that supposedly prevented women from painting landscapes. And pictured here is a comparison between the work of Susie Barstow and critic of female painters Worthington Rittridge, um, interestingly similar in compositional scenery and skill. <laughs> Indeed, there were other veritable restrictions in place for many women pursuing a painting profession. A vast majority of art academies did not admit women, and the ideal professional artist, more likely to receive patrons and develop professional networks, was firmly genteel and male. So how did so many women circumvent these tangible restrictions and social constructs to paint in the style of the Hudson River School? For one, women received informal training through familial connections. For example, painter Julia Hart Beers, pictured here, was the sister to William and James Hart. Jane Stewart was the daughter of Gilbert Stewart. Sarah Cole was the sister to Thomas Cole. Harriet Caney Peel was the wife of Rembrandt Peel and Evelina Mount was the niece to William Sidney Mount. Additionally, scholar Nancy Siegel asserts that women used instructional manuals, like the Young Lady's Assistant in Drawing and Painting, published in 1833, and the American Drawing Book, published in 1847, to develop artistic skills needed for landscape painting. Even though women scaled the same mountains as their male counterparts, and found ways to receive necessary art training, Women were excluded from being considered professionals due to their gender. While the ideal Hudson River School artist was male, women were still there. And it is an antiquated idea that women could not or were not prolific working artists in the Hudson River School. The initiative to, cert, to insert the stories and work of women into the canon of American art need not stop with the history of women working as artists. I also conducted and compiled research on the lesser known lives of women with connection to this site, a location so closely tied to the inception of the first major American art movement, to elucidate the female experience within and beyond the Hudson River School. This property, then called Cedar Grove, was never owned by Thomas Cole himself. It was always owned by the family of the artist's wife, Mariah Bartow Cole, and then passed on through a succession of Cole family women. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, women, including Mariah, Sarah Cole, Emily Cole, Florence Vincent Cole, and Edith Cole Silverstein, served important roles here as title holders, artists, and stewards of the property. Mariah Bartow is the reason why this home became the house of Thomas Cole. By the time Thomas arrived in Catskill in 1825, Mariah was living here with her uncle, the owner of the house and property. Thomas was renting a cottage from her uncle, which is how he met and eventually became engaged to the young Mariah Bartow. After marrying Mariah and moving into the main house in 1836, Thomas used the site to produce, exhibit, and sell paintings. In letters exchanged between the two when Thomas is traveling, Mariah often provides updates on the development of their children, as well as loving words of support. In 1844, Thomas is in Boston when Mariah writes, and I quote, you must not feel anxious about us for we are doing very well. I wish that you were here now to enjoy our quiet hours, but I do not wish to hurry you from scenes improving. 
Mariah and Thomas also exchanged letters that discussed politics and current affairs. In 1842, Mariah writes to Thomas when he is in Paris, this do-nothing government is in such a state, I fear you will be disappointed when you return. There is scarcely anything to be heard of but want of money and two hard times to get it. And yes, these are Mariah's words and not that of yesterday's New York Times. After Thomas passed away unexpectedly at the age of 47, Mariah kept the new studio, the very place we are sitting today, as Thomas Cole left it for many years. She allowed artists to visit and rent out studio space. In effect, Mariah helped to spread his legacy by helping others to experience his work in this place. When artist Jasper Francis Cropsey visited the studio two years after Cole's passing, he remarked, and I quote, it seemed as if Mr. Cole would be in in a few minutes, for everything remains as when he last left painting, end quote. Sarah Cole, Thomas Cole's younger sister, further continued the legacy of this property as an artist's home. Sarah Cole was a fellow Hudson River School artist in its earliest years. Sarah's corpus of works consist of oil paintings and prints, often copies of her brother's compositions. Very few of Sarah's works have survived, but two oil paintings pictured here um, are hanging in the sitting room of the main house. After Thomas Cole's death, Sarah began to live at Cedar Grove and exhibit her works publicly um, in order to support herself financially. She also exhibited at the National Academy, Maryland Historical Society, and American Art Union. Referred to by one newspaper as the first female printmaker in America, Sarah was a leader for future generations of female Hudson River School artists to come. Emily Cole was the only one of Thomas and Mariah's four children to exhibit a passion and penchant for painting. Emily was just five years old when her father passed away, but Thomas had already recognized a budding artistic interest in his daughter, um, whom he called Miss Periwinkle. Emily's connection to the art world through her father's legacy and a brief study at a New York City art school may have encouraged her to pursue an artistic career. From letters, we know Emily's creative aspirations were supported by her family, and Emily was also in conversation with other artists, including Frederick Church, J.M. Falconer, and her aunt, Sarah. Over the course of her lifetime, Emily painted a striking body of works consisting of over 100 watercolors on paper and painted porcelain objects that now reside in the collection of the Thomas Cole National Historic Site. Rather than depicting sweeping and sublime vistas of landscapes, Emily chose as her subject plants, fruits, and flowers, close up and in isolation with an astounding attention to detail. As explored in the scholarship of Emmanuel Rudolph, women of class comprise a significant part of the botanical illustration community as painting flowering angiosperms was considered an appropriate feminine pursuit. Emily still shared her father's and Hudson River School artists' love of nature, as many of her plants and flower subjects, goldenrod, peonies, thistle and strawberries, go locally in the Hudson River Valley and were probably encountered in her own gardens here and in the surrounding landscape. The porcelain that Emily Cole painted her floral designs onto was produced in Limoges, France by the famous factory of Jean Pouat, known for porcelain of fine texture, thinness, and lightness. All the adornment on Emily Cole's porcelain was designed and painted by her and showed the same attention to detail as her works on paper. Women dominated the fields of porcelain painting in the 19th and 20th centuries in the United States. Even women living in isolated areas were nonetheless able to pursue porcelain painting through instructional books and primers. Emily's paint of the porcelain also found its way into New York City exhibitions and collections of China painting. Emily was also a charter member of the New York Society of Ceramic Arts, which was founded in 1892, with the objective to promote the appreciation of ceramic arts. Emily also sold her porcelain locally in the Hudson Valley, and in her obituary, she is referred to as Catskill China Painter. And this is significant, since it tells us that in Catskill, Emily made a name for herself as an artist beyond that of just daughter of Thomas Cole. Florence Cole Vincent, Thomas's granddaughter, and Edith Cole Silverstein, Thomas's great-granddaughter, continued the work of Mariah Cole in preserving the legacy of the site as an artist's home by directing papers and letters into archives 
and advocating tirelessly for the formation of the site into a museum. This was a challenging effort, which was ultimately turned successful in 2001. For the dedication of the museum, Edith presented the chairman of the site with the original brass keys to the front door, a symbolic gesture designating the museum board, employees, and public as the rightful heirs to the Cole estate. Edith and Florence's work helped to ensure what we, ha we have what we do today, the Cole site as an educational and exhibiting institution. I was able to highlight these lesser known histories of the women of Cedar Grove by scripting and implementing a special tour prototype just this month entitled The Women of Cedar Grove. This was a tour offered to visitors twice a day during our weekend hours. This tour presents the lives and works of Mariah, Sarah, Emily, Florence, and Edith in the context of the life of Thomas Cole and the history of the Hudson River School as visitors are guided through the main house. My goal with this tour is to make a fuller history of Cedar Grove, incomplete without the stories of women, more readily accessible to our visitors. My research on Emily Cole also evolved into curating an exhibition spotlighting her painted porcelain and watercolor botanicals in the second floor children's room of the main house, which was the room that Emily Cole grew up in as a young girl. Emily's painted porcelain and watercolor botanical work is accompanied by interpretive material exploring Emily's biography, the history of botanical illustration, and the nature of porcelain painting. The Arts of Emily Cole exhibit at the Cole site is the first known solo show of her work. I see this exhibition as a needed lens through which visitors are encouraged to contemplate the diverse impact of American landscape painting, as well as the gendered nature of the 19th century art world in the United States. The Women of Cedar Grove tour and the Art of Emily Cole exhibition, which has garnered welcome and enthusiastic interest in our visitors and followers, illustrate the ability for the Thomas Cole site to successfully pursue curatorial and educational initiatives that explore the intersection of women, art, and society. At the Thomas Cole site, there is so much potential to continue sharing the stories of women through tours highlighting the lives of Cedar Grove women as well as exhibition that present the lesser known artwork of women in the Cole family and the larger Hudson River School. Highlighting the lives of women allow for the presentation of a fuller history of our beloved Cedar Grove and the first major American art movement it inspired. Ultimately, I am deeply excited as a feminist and a historian about the future trajectory of American art institutions and scholarship and the work of women that we will continue to discover and exhibit. Thank you. I now have the pleasure of welcoming Maeve McCool to the podium. Thank you, Amanda. Today I'm going to talk a bit about Thomas Cole and learning about art, learning about and experiencing art in nature. Thomas Cole, as many of us know, often hiked into the Catskill Mountains and was inspired by the beauty and sublimity that he found there. The untouched nature astounded him since Cole had grown up in a quickly industrializing England. And on one trip, on July 6, 1835, Cole writes about two of the happiest days that he can remember spent hiking in the mountains. He writes, dark forests, rugged rocks, towering mountains encompassed us, and the night breeze brought the sound of moving trees, falling streams, and the clear chant of the whippoorwill to our listening ears. It was grand, it was sublime, to be thus by ourselves at midnight, in the midst of the fabled solitude of woods and mountains, beside which all the world was slumbering. He describes this journey with whimsy, referencing Rip Van Winkle and fairies in the woods, and paints an image of escaping the frivolities of society in the dense and undeveloped nature. In my first few weeks at the Cole site, I was taking in information about Thomas Cole and his work and thought that I truly understood what he was intending to accomplish. But on my first excursion on the art trail, on one of our guided hikes, however, 
Cole's paintings became visceral and manifested in front of me, revealing the source of his lifelong passion for nature. The Hudson River School Art Trail is a series of hikes that lead to locations where Thomas Cole and other 19th century landscape artists made their famous works and is the focus of my research project. During my first experience on the trail, our nature guide, Jeff Vincent, described how we were traversing the same exact trail that Thomas Cole had used, and before him, it was a Native American trail, and before them, the path had been formed by deer. The immensity of time, nature, and my legacy and connections to the earth in that very spot became instilled in me. And the purpose of experiencing nature and art together became clear. Despite how cliche it sounds, I was literally walking in the footsteps of Cole. I found that this experience of hiking and observing nature while discussing Thomas Cole revealed how much the environment really impacted Thomas Cole's artistic endeavors. Cole's romantic vision of getting lost in the woods became so relatable when I went on the same journey for myself. My role in this fellowship is to dissect how experiences in nature like Cole's and my own happen and figure out how we as a museum can best facilitate sharing this passion for nature through outdoor programming. What can we gain by learning in a specific natural environment rather than in a gallery or a classroom setting? How do we impart the fascination with the sublime in nature to others? To follow these questions, I assessed our own outdoor programming in comparison with that of others and thought deeply about what changes we can make to create a more impactful and sustainable model of outdoor programming. In the 2018 season, our outdoor programming included four hikes and two paddles as part of the art trail program and one kids paint out event on site. We did the art trail hikes with Jeff Vincent of Catskill Mountain Wild, in which we went on day hikes and paddles on Fridays once a month, sometimes with a content expert. The group would hike into the mountains or set out in canoes and make incremental stops to discuss Thomas Cole's life and the history of the place that we were in. Often at the art trail destination, visitors would join me in sketching or painting the view before us. My role on these hikes was to act as a Thomas Cole educator, and in that role, one of the most tranquil experiences I had was on one of our paddles. In the peak of summer heat, we tied up all of our canoes and some of the group swam or floated in the river, some ventured on the banks to look at plants, and some discussed Thomas Cole and painted with watercolors. That moment was educational, yet peaceful and whimsical. The things that make the Art Trail program unique are the fact that our hikes are site-specific and the exact environments of Thomas Cole's paintings. More than that, in 2018, we invited content experts on the hikes that add fascinating information about Thomas Cole, plant species, and art making, and forms a more in-depth conversation. One example is the photographer and artist, Carrie Russell, pictured here talking with the group. In addition to being an artist, Russell is a naturalist. His careful eye was able to point out plant species from Cole's paintings that were also present along the trails. In addition to pointing out tree and plant species, such as mullein, which is shown here, Russell gave the group basics on how to identify different families of trees based on leaves. I noticed that through compelling topics and drawing or painting activities, visitors were more engaged during these events and left with information that could remain relevant to them for a long time. My own observations were reinforced by surveys that visitors filled out on the hikes where I asked what they did and didn't like. Time and again, people wrote that they loved the chance to take time in nature and experience tranquility, and they loved the enthusiasm and knowledge of the tour guides. While many of the 2018 art trail events were very successful, about half the events were underattended. Some hikes had two to five people, whereas some were sold out at 12 to 16. The events with the highest attendance were the two paddles and the final fall time hike with Carrie Russell, most likely because they provided a service that people wouldn't be able to find for themselves. This divide has several explanations. All of the art trail events were held on Fridays and ranged from anywhere from four to seven hours long. And while logistics seem trivial, these choices immensely impact the audience of the events. They were only accessible to people who did not work or were on vacation 
and able to do a physical activity for a great length of time. So in addition to the added theme or content, the organization of events is the biggest factor in the erratic success of the art trail program. My conclusions here were supported by Nancy Lopez, the founder and director of Trails and Vistas, who has been going on art-themed hikes in Nevada for about 20 years. Lopez, through many trials and mistakes, found over the years that events should always last from two to four hours and only be held on weekends. Consistency in the duration and timing events and having annual events keeps the program present in people's minds. Lopez has found success with incorporating artists on the hikes similar to our own experience as well. In addition to speaking with Lopez, I visited an array of educators and museum staff at other institutions that have outdoor programming and identified what did and didn't work and found ways to apply this knowledge to our own site. For example, on one site visit to the Clark Art Institute, I took a guided walking tour of the grounds that lasted a bit under an hour. And while this tour gave informative tidbits about the environmental initiatives that the Clark is undertaking, it didn't really provide any takeaway or story. Because of this, very few people attended the program and there was little note of it in the museum's online and social presence. This visit sort of reinforced the idea that people are searching for events that leave them with new and compelling ideas. Another site visit was to the Brandywine Conservancy and Museum of Art in Chadsford, PA. But unlike the Clark Art Institute, this guided nature walk had a content expert who was both a naturalist and a poet, Susan Sharks, and was joined by the Dean of Education and Public Programs at the museum, Mary Cronin. This walk gave background information on the institution, but moreover, it was focused on taking a close look at the environment and natural species. At one point, Sharks asked the group to find a spot in nature and spend a full two minutes just silently observing what was around us. How natural is this environment around you? What do you notice? When given the opportunity to be silent and observational, everyone in the group was able to return with a specific species or sound that they hadn't seen before. After the hike, Sharks took the group into the museum to an exhibition of contemporary work looking at the sublime in nature and made connections between our observations and the works in the gallery. Once again, we were asked to look closely at what was in front of us, forcing the group to slow down and fully understand the exhibition on a deeper level. This experience reflects Cole's mentality about art and nature perfectly. He criticized people in his time for not paying enough attention to nature and his sentiments remain true today. Cole looked carefully at his natural environment and sought to make connections between his noticings and his artistic practice in an effort to encourage people to do the same. Through something as simple as two minutes of silence, visitors can gain a better understanding of what an artwork or an environment can convey. In this instance, the Brandywine Museum also used their hike as exhibition programming enriching and enhancing the natural experience and forming links between different areas of study. After collecting experiences and information about museum outdoor experiences, my next step was to think deeply about how we could best use our art trail and outdoor programming to entice visitors to seek a passion for experiencing and preserving nature. All of the positive experiences that I had while researching this topic were scientifically and historically inquisitive but also fostered a better personal connection to my direct environment. The best experiences that I had were the most complex ones. Professor of Arts and Education, Young M. Kang Song writes, the arts expose viewers to new ways of seeing, feeling, and thinking about nature. This can lead to a greater awareness of and motivation to act on behalf of nature. We hold this principle to high regard at the Cole site with our touring and mission statement and our outdoor programming provides another opportunity to remain true to this core value. With these many thoughts in mind, I believe that our future model of outdoor programming should be one focused on education and be used as a model of exhibition programming. Much of our current program has the possibility 
to fulfill these objectives, but we don't have the capacity to oversee the program and most importantly, lack sustainable funding. The art trail specifically has presented itself in many different iterations, making it historically challenging for our visitors to keep up to date on the program. We don't have a dedicated staff member or budget for the art trail, but if we did, the ideal programming model could provide learning opportunities built around exhibitions. For instance, hikes could go to locations that are currently represented in exhibitions at our site, like the Catskill Creek, which is the focus of our 2019 exhibition, and include a gallery visit to form connections between the experience and the artwork. In addition, hikes could include the contemporary artists who exhibit at the Cole House as content experts, or we could develop arts activities that show the process of the artists, such as making a camera obscura or making pigments from nature. In the instance that we don't have that ideal funding, there are ways that we can better utilize our own site in affordable ways to promote the same ideas. After compiling my research and defining what we need to better connect to our natural environment, I considered what actions the coal site could take to form a more sustainable and influential program. It's easy to forget that the Thomas Coal site is itself an art trail site and one that can be used with little to no cost. Thomas Cole himself painted the view from his porch throughout his time here, making it one of the most important art trail sites that we really have. So with this in mind, I propose that we continue our much loved hikes when possible with the alterations that I've considered, but join them together with more constant outdoor programming on site. In 2018, our on-site programming consisted of one event, a free public kids paint out in which visitors could paint on site from nature. This one day event had 45 participants. This number alone shows how much our immediate community needs a more accessible way to connect to Thomas Cole, nature, and art making. In addition to the site, we also have the Skywalk, Thomas Cole's grave, and the Casco Creek within walking distance of the Thomas Cole National Historic Site, all of which are incredible resources at our disposal. And my next steps in this project are to implement free learning activities on site that enrich our experience of nature. So this May, a new series of kids art out activities will go through a trial run on site, which will hopefully be revisited throughout the season. The workshops will focus on fascinating pieces of Cole's interests like architecture, observational study, and color. And visitors will be prompted to look more closely at aspects of the natural world around them, as well as in Thomas Cole's work. I invite you all to come to this free public program during the dates listed here and take a save the date card on your way out, which are in the front. The Thomas Cole site has the extreme advantage of being nestled in the Catskill Mountains so close to the places that inspired the artist himself and can continue to motivate our current society. We see Cole as an environmentalist and strive to motivate our visitors to protecting and honoring nature in the way that he did. Through well-planned, meaningful experiences and educational projects on the art trail and on site, we can better support this mission in the true spirit of Thomas Cole. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Peter Fedork. For the past 10 months, I've been trying to answer a single question. What was most important to Thomas Cole at the end of his life? It's a pleasure to be with you tonight to share the answers I've discovered. When I did come to the site, I had just completed a research paper on Thomas Cole's role in establishing a visual culture for what would become the American environmental movement. I thought I knew Cole. Over the past 10 months, I believe I actually have gotten to know Cole, and all that started when I came across his personal journal, Thoughts and Occurrences. Thoughts and Occurrences was written during the last 14 years of Cole's life. I poured over it, studied it, and I transcribed every word. What I found was enlightening. 
Take a look at how Cole writes this journal with crossouts and edits on almost every page. It became clear to me that he's writing this journal for posterity. And my goal was to use these primary sources to draw direct connections between Cole's opinions and the happenings in the world around him. I quickly understood that Cole was interested in far more than just art and nature, but held vested interests in the sciences, technological innovations, poetry, philosophy, literature, and so much more. I wanted to find out which of these topics he was most interested in during the last years of his life. But I only found a handful of lines where he makes explicit reference to either positive or negative, the world around him and what he thought about it. So I continued on to a second journal. This one concurrent with the first from 1841 to 1842. I wrote, transcribed dozens of letters and I read hundreds more. All in an effort to find these explicit references that could help explain his mind to me. Now I knew he had a rather pessimistic worldview. This much is clear from his frequent melancholic musings. What I didn't know was how I could interpret this pessimism in a way that would shed light on how he fit into his world and what it would mean for reading his paintings. In order to understand what kind of information was being disseminated to Cole in Catskill, I read what he was reading. I read the weekly paper of the Catskill Messenger across eight years between 1840 and 1848. I'd like to briefly touch on three topics from his world. The first is pictured here. In September of 1840, a presidential election year, there was a political rally held at Cedar Grove with 6,000 people in attendance. It was hosted by local political activists. Now the political party was the Whig party. They were formed in opposition to the tyrannical presidency of Andrew Jackson. They favored a big Congress, small president approach and worked on repairing a system of national banks and infrastructure. The candidate was William Henry Harrison. His slogan of Tippecanoe and Tyler II is considered the most famous presidential slogan in our country's history. His campaign broke new ground on how candidates could appeal to voters and garner support. It was, in a word, revolutionary. Harrison wins the election three months after the rally at Cedar Grove and then dies only a few months after being sworn into office. In one of the rare occasions where Cole provides direct commentary on his world, he writes to a friend saying, our president has been elected and alas has departed. Since the death of Washington, no man has died more lamented. In terms of foreign policy news, not much was good about it in the 1840s. By 1846, the United States was on the brink of war at both their northern and southern borders. And I'll echo Amanda by reminding you that this is from 1846 and not yesterday's Times newspaper. <laughs> Both the northern and southern conflicts were featured in the local newspaper in Catskill. And they're cloaked in issues of territorial expansion for the United States and what it would mean. Peace was reached with Canada and by extension Great Britain, but not with Mexico. Cole weighs in his disdain for the latter by lamenting to a friend that, quote, nobody knows what this vile Mexican war will bring about. In Thoughts and Occurrences, Cole often also refers to it as a most unchristian war, calling on future judgment that will come to pass as a result of, quote, the destruction of our weak neighbor. As his use of unchristian suggests, Cole was religious. In Catskill, he was a member of St. Luke's Episcopal Church, where he was a vestryman, represented the church on regional levels at gatherings, and drew the plans for the rebuilding of the church in 1840. Christianity in the 1840s was exploding in popularity in New York State and in the United States. It's the beginning of what we refer to as the modern religious revival movement. Thousands converted to Protestantism, and hundreds of churches were founded across New York State and the greater United States. This growing wave of religiosity dominated social spheres, social spheres at the time. Excuse me. When we see Thomas Cole using unchristian as an adjective, we understand he's using the vocabulary of his time to describe nearly everything. 
when describing the natural world holds consistent with this, writing in Thoughts and Occurrences that art should be the imitation of the perfect as far as can be in nature. Art is, in fact, man's lowly imitation of the creative power of the Almighty. This cultural shift of modern religious revivalism is another example of how dramatically Cole's world is changing in front of him, but also with him. When trying to identify the source of his pessimistic attitude, which I assumed lay in his observations of the world around him, I was at a loss. We know Cole strongly responded to the changing world of nature with a public lecture on environmentalism in 1841, right here in Catskill. This actually emboldened my search for deeper meaning in Cole's mind because along with his mournful lament of natural degradation, he expressed tangible motivations to act on these opinions. I felt certain he would have wanted to react similarly to other issues, but through all of this, I couldn't put my finger on what those issues were. I felt like I was looking in on the answer, but only with peripheral evidence. There was no way to completely reconcile this pessimistic attitude with only the few concrete opinions he does express. So I want to take a moment to share a quote with you from a dissertation written in 1954 by Kenneth Labud. Labud writes, Cole did not go along then with the predominant temper of his day, which saw in the growth of resources, expansion of territory, tripling of population, and the building of canals and railroads a comforting aura, which made the doctrine of progress one of historic inevitability and righteous responsibility. The historic inevitability that was important to Cole was that empires will give way to vices which will lead it to decay. There was no one political, economic, or social event which overwhelmed the artist enough to explain this underlying pessimism. So when I read this mostly, I was relieved that I wasn't the only one who had this problem. I decided I needed to reconsider my own perspectives and reprioritize my focus. I began to think, what if instead of looking for the source of pessimism, I looked for its product and worked my way backwards? We know from looking at works like The Course of Empire that Cole's obsessed with allegorical mess messaging. The series in itself proves that Cole believed history repeats itself. And the great classical empires that shaped so much of our Western world could have foreshadowed his own world's demise. Of course, in this series, Cole reconciles humanity's viral destruction with nature's calm, stealing back over the landscape in the final painting. Cole carries on this theme in The Voyage of Life, exploring the trials and tribulations we all must face throughout each of our lives. In this series, we also reach some sort of reconciliation after all is said and done. Now, we celebrate these allegor allegorical series as evidence that Cole was a master artist through and through. I discovered not all in, in his time would agree. Charles Landman, one of the most well-known art critics of the 19th century New York art world, said in a letter to Asher Brown Durand, one of Cole's closest friends, I am more and more confirmed in the opinion that Cole will never paint anything great hereafter. He wrote this after spending an afternoon sketching and talking with Cole. He later added to the letter, I was not pleased with his manner of speaking of American landscape painters. I realized Cole's perspective as an artist might have been undergoing an evolutionary shift during the 1840s that brought on this critique. What I learned is that Thomas Cole actually picked this fight three years before Landman wrote that. Cole wrote, my dear critics, though I call you critics, I do not consider all of you entitled to that honorable distinction. The art of painting is not merely a thing for amusement. It may amuse you, as your criticisms may, but it has higher aims. Now, he published this in an open letter that was distributed throughout New York City. With these sources, I'm led to believe that Cole has not lost his touch as a painter, as Landman suggests. But he is, though, radically altering the norm, concerned with how and why his artwork must be created. And it was enlarging the divide between him and his peers. 
Remember, through my research, I ultimately aimed to bring Cole's worldview into the light of his artwork. In 1845, Cole wrote to Jonathan Sturgis, uh, informing him that he was working on a new five-part series to be painted for the public. The series would have no commission, and Cole would front the costs himself. The preliminary sketch for the series is shown here, crudely depicting the compositional structure for each of those five paintings. And we begin to see these images take greater shape. What I'm showing you are the five oil studies that Cole prepared for this series between the years of 1846 and 1848. Now each of these canvases would measure 12 inches by 18 inches. Each of the final five canvases were to measure five feet by eight feet each. For a series without commission, this is a massive undertaking to say the least. Allow me to tell you the story of two pilgrims. We'll work in three layers to tell their story, and the central work is the first painting. This is where our two pilgrims meet and part ways. One travels to the right, and one travels to the left. Now the two paintings in that middle layer are the second and third paintings in this series, but not in a specific order. We see our pilgrims traveling down their separate roads, one to the right and one to the left, but roads that look vastly different. Based on descriptions of this series by a close friend of Cole, we know the deeper story this was meant to relate. The pilgrim on the right seeks a world fruitful and bountiful. He passes impressive architecture filled with golden allusions to wealth and riches on his way to a horizon filled with the faint apparition of a grandiose palace. The pilgrim on the left meets with no such pleasures, but is instead forced to travel across toilsome rock and barren landscape, urged on by an apparition of his own, the Christian cross. The fourth and fifth paintings are the topmost layer and complete the journey for our travelers. Their destinations are unlike what seem to be promised in the second and third paintings. The pilgrim on the right arrives and finds not a palace, but a dim desert of broken rock. The pilgrim on the left toils on to find the clouds opening up to a magnificent sunrise and beautiful blue sky. Now the narrative of a pilgrim on a journey finds its roots in the 17th century in a text called Pilgrim's Progress written by John Bunyan. It's impossible not to notice the blatant Christian iconography here. Cole, in fact, titled the series The Cross and the World. We know from the titles Cole provided for the studies that it was meant to tell the stories of two distinct pilgrims, the pilgrim of the world and the pilgrim of the cross. Now, I invite you to separate your interpretation of this work from the religious designations of Cole's time so we can dig deeper into what this allegorical series might have to offer. When we think about it critically, the story opens up much wider than just the cross and the world. It becomes one of materialism and spirituality as well. The promises of material gain have short-term merits and long-term consequences, while the opposite could be said of spiritual commitment. When we think about this message, it applies itself to subjects we know Thomas Cole was passionate about. For example, the promises of industry have short-term merits and long-term consequences, while well, the realities of, of sustainability might present difficulty at first, but will have lasting positive effects. Now, I could attach a number of similar narratives to this pattern, but my task is to look into the artist's mind. So let's go even deeper. Well, it's easy to call the Course of Empire a cyclical series because of the implication that history will repeat itself. The narrative in this series has a decided beginning and an end. Likewise, in The Voyage of Life, the boatsman in this series who represents each and every one of us on our life's journey is trapped. Through the good and the bad, he's bound to his boat and to his river. There's only one direction of travel for him. What we see in the cross in the world is dramatically different. There's one beginning, two narratives, 
and two endings. This is where I think the answer to my question lies. What was most important to Thomas Cole during the last years of his life? Choice. He experienced extremes of every nature over the course of his life. He saw the environment he loved begin to crumble under this new machine of progress. The political machine, a different kind of machine, began to take a frighteningly powerful shape. Cole was born when Napoleon was dreaming of world conquest, and he died the year Abraham Lincoln served his first term in Congress. Now, Napoleon and Lincoln don't have much to do with Cole specifically, but I can't emphasize how radically the world changed over the course of his lifetime. While he willingly participated in some of this change, he was also fervently opposed to much of it. By the 1840s, I don't think he just believed in choice. I think he needed to believe in choice. Otherwise, his world would continue to transform in ways he couldn't predict, and no one could choose to stop it. He worked on the final paintings right where you're sitting. It consumed him for two years, and suddenly, he died. I'm using the studies here to tell the story because he never finished working on all of the larger canvases. Three full-size canvases were completed in this room. One remained here, half finished on his easel. One was not commenced at all. Those three finished large canvases haven't been seen since 1881. They remained in Mariah Cole's possession after Thomas died. They were publicly exhibited at least seven times. They were sold at least twice, and no one has yet been able to determine where they are now. Historical figures of the 1820s, 30s, 40s, and onwards into the rest of the 19th century are the people who shaped the foundation of this country. They made decisions about politics, globalization, and religion, about economics, about race, and gender. And those decisions all cascade forward through our history to influence the way our world operates today. Mr. Cole was not making any of those important decisions, but I don't believe he had any interest in doing so. He did, however, seem to understand the gravity of the decisions made by those of his time. It burdened him his entire life. By 1845, he realized what he could do, and that was use his skill as an artist to ensure the people making those decisions took the right considerations into mind before doing so. The cross in the world is about choice and about the agency we each have to navigate through difficult times, always stopping to ask, is this best? In the hope that our answer to that question might direct us towards a better world for those around us and for those in our futures. With all that happened during the 19th century in Cole's lifetime, this series was not a mistaken, unfinished project by an artist out of his prime. He thought very actively about sending this message out into the world. I see this series as Cole's magnum opus. For him, it was a work to last the ages. He meant it to guide humanity's decisions by cautioning virtue over vice, and above all else, always reminding us that we have a choice. Thank you for your time.